If I can get the first slide. Maybe I do it. Oh, that's not the first one. Let's go back. So I want to talk about something that Professor Preddy started with, which was this big storm surge that, that, that the UK just experienced. And that storm surge, the underlying cause of that storm surge, we all know this. We don't like to say it out loud as scientists, but we all know it, is that atmospheric greenhouse gases are increasing. And the biggest one is CO2. And this is a graph of atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations um, over time, taken from the top of Mauna Loa Volcano out in Hawaii. Good reason we use the, that spot, because it's out in the middle of the ocean. It's well mixed. Gives us an idea of, of uh, what the true atmospheric concentrations are. And what you can see with this is that atmospheric CO2 concentrations are increasing. This was last up updated in August. We know that. We know that's happening. We know what the cause is, right? Fossil fuel combustion is the dominant cause of increasing atmospheric concentrations of CO2. I want you to pay attention to the wiggles in the line. I'll come back to that in a minute. We're on thin ice, if you pardon the analogy. We're on thin ice because climate is changing very quickly, and we know that that's impact. It's going to impact our lives. It's going to impact the food system. It's going to impact the cost. It's going to impact the ability to produce. It's going to impact people in poorer countries disproportionately to the people in wealthy countries. We really need to do something about this. What can we do? Well, we all know that emissions reduction is an absolutely critical part of the climate crisis. We have to reduce emissions. But what I've done here is I've taken some very optimistic scenarios. And I'm, I'm an optimist, but I'm not quite this optimistic. What I've done is I've taken the rate of CO2 increase over the past, and I've extended it into the future, assuming that we're not going to continue to, to increase the rate at which we're emitting. We know that's not the case. But let's just use this as a hypothetical example. If we do that, climate change is going to accelerate. If we have a very unrealistically optimistic emissions reduction scenario, in this case the black dotted line, emissions are still going to increase and climate change is still going to accelerate. So emissions reduction alone will not solve the climate crisis. We need to figure out a way to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, get it out of the atmosphere, so that we don't experience such rapid climate change. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that? And that's where we come back to the wiggles in the lines. These wiggles in the lines are caused by natural processes, ones that we experience and live with every day. Every time a line goes down, every time the wiggle goes down, it's because plants, primarily in the northern hemisphere, where most of the land mass is, are drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere through a process called photosynthesis. Farmers, ranchers, they know about this very well. They manage it all the time. CO2 comes into the plants. They form their plant parts. Some of it goes into the soil. When the wiggle goes up, it's because microbial respiration, that really important process of decomposition that breaks down the plant material after it's died, releases the CO2 back to the atmosphere. That's the natural carbon cycle. That has to go on. But if you notice, it goes on year after year after year after year. And in some years, the amount of photosynthesis exceeds the amount of microbial respiration on a seasonal basis a little bit. And so the next question is, can we manage lands? Can we manage that photosynthesis and decomposition to help be part of the solution to the climate crisis. And that's what my lab began to ask. Well, how can we get CO2 out of the atmosphere? Can we use agriculture, which is often caused, uh, called part of the problem, can it become part of the solution? Well, maybe. Um, the atmosphere holds about 760 times 10 to the 15th grams, that's what a PG is, a petagram, of carbon. And the vegetation holds less, about 610. The soil holds a lot. The soil holds a lot, at least 2,000 times 10 to the 15th grams. That's a lot. It probably holds more. We, can, we can't uh, quantify it exactly because soil is kind of this big amorphous pool. But there's a lot of carbon storage there and a lot of potential to pour more carbon into that pool. Where would we pour it in if we could? Well, there's many different places we might look for that. But one of the places we should start is grasslands. And that's because grasslands are living literally kind of on their ecological edge. They tend to occur in places where there's 
more water lost from the ecosystem, from evaporation and transpiration, than water input from rainfall. And so they're always looking for water to survive. They always have to look for water. And the way they do that is producing roots. Those roots are their little structures that are going out there looking for water so that they can grow during that, the dry periods and survive during the dry periods. And any time a plant allocates their organic matter, their carbon, below ground looking for something like, like water, there's a higher probability that that carbon's going to stay in the soil. So grasslands have tremendous potential to be very, very carbon-rich ecosystems. Grasslands are also important because they're one of the dominant cover types globally. Grasslands cover about 30% of the global land surface. They cover 50% of the UK. They cover 50% of the land area in California, where I'm from and where I do my research, and over half of the global land use. So this is a very important ecosystem with, with tremendous potential. Of course, we all want to increase carbon in soils, organic matter. Carbon, uh, organic matter um, is, is the form in which we deliver carbon to soils. Organic matter has a high carbon content. And so farmers and ranchers have been managing soil for organic matter for a long time. Professor Preddy uh, alluded to that. As we add more organic matter, more carbon to soil, we increase the fertility, we increase the water holding capacity, and we increase the soil stability. Organic matter is sticky. It holds soil together. And that all leads to greater sustainability and greater productivity, the things that we absolutely need. So how do we do that? How do we go, around, uh, go about increasing the amount of organic matter content and, so and carbon content in soils? Well, my lab's been investigating something that may seem kind of obvious, but interestingly, there had been very little research done from a climate change perspective, and that is taking waste, things that people throw away, dump in landfills or slurry ponds where it emits, uh, emits a lot of greenhouse gas, turn it into compost, and apply it to land to grow more food. Whoops, there we go. Well, what happens when you do that? You get a lot more above ground growth. You can increase your production potential. So here are data from our research. The red bars are the sites that had received compost once in 2008. The blue bars are the control sites. And from a single application, we increased forage, forage production by about 40%. And it continues. We just finished sampling this year. We also increase carbon storage in soils. Anything above the line here shows increased soil carbon, lots of interannual variability. But the bottom line is, is that this carbon's getting into soil. And this is new carbon. We've, we've, we removed the compost carbon from this, from this analysis. When we do a full life cycle assessment, uh, trying to understand where carbon is being emitted from the, the, the transportation component, the, the other various costs like the livestock on these lands, um, and compare that to two common practices, manure and fertilizer application, we see a huge carbon sink, primarily from avoided emissions, relative to these, these other two processes. So over a million hectares, actually a small proportion of my state uh, rangeland, a small proportion of the rangelands here, we see about 30 million metric tons of CO2 savings. Uh, we see that we can, we, now extending this out over larger areas, that the, the carbon actually goes down deep into the soil, which means it's likely to stick, stick around for a while. And we can save about 40 metric tons of carbon per hectare over a, a long time period. Very large um, savings. What does that mean from a climate perspective? Well, if we scale this up, to about 6 million hectares, about half of the land area in the UK, a quarter of the land area, the uh, grassland area in, in California, we can offset all of the livestock. We can offset half of the commercial re and residential energy sector and about a quarter of the electrical generation for the state of California. Grazing is also a potential management that can increase carbon storage. Again, scaled up, we can get up to about 42 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent uh, just from grazing alone if you look at the grazed areas in our regions. So just to summarize, agriculture can be part of the solution to climate change in a significant way, and we need to be looking at this. Soil carbon sequestration is possible and quantifiable in rangelands. There are key questions that remain and that need to be explored, particularly with regard to grazing and what can be done there, and particularly with regard to our more marginal lands, especially in arid environments. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>